Welcome to Digital Therapeutics Edition of Digital Health Today, and I'm your host, Eugene Borohovic. My awesome guest today is none other than Andy Molnar, the CEO of Digital Therapeutics Alliance. Andy is about a year into the new job, advancing DTA's mission to broaden the understanding, adoption, and integration of clinically evaluated digital therapeutics with patients, clinicians, payers, policymakers, and other stakeholders through the education, advocacy, and cross-industry collaboration. In our conversation today, we talk about the DTA, of course, Andy and his new role as the CEO, what they're working on to propel the DTX industry forward, the international scope of his work in Europe, the APAC, and beyond, and of course, the recent trends with commercial payers and reimbursements, or lack thereof, and much more. But before we dive in, I've seen Andy present years ago with one of his other professional hats on, and what struck me then is his big and happy smile. So when Megan Coder introduced us right before the health conference in Boston last November, that smile did not disappoint when we finally met. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Andy Molnar. Andy, welcome to the DTX edition of Digital Health Today. And as always, we try to get to know people and the trailblazers and the drivers of the industry. So give us a little bit about your background. Who are you? And also as a bonus, maybe a small interesting fact about yourself. So we get to know you as a person, not just the CEO of Digital Therapeutics Alliance. <laughs> sure. I have one, an interesting fact that I tell almost everybody. So I don't know if it's going to be interesting anymore, but uh, I'll get to that. So about four and a half years ago, I left working in big pharma on the market access team to join Pair Therapeutics. And I remember one of my colleagues went to Pair and he asked if I wanted to join. And I think I thought about it for about five seconds and it just seemed like the future of healthcare. And he said, do you have any questions? And I was like, not really. Like the fact that people are taking software through clinical trials to treat disease just sounded so exciting. And I thought to myself, if this fails and in three months I'm out of a job, I'll be happy that I took this risk. Now, as you can see, I'm very happy that I took the risk. <laughs> Absolutely. And you lost a lot less hair in your pharma days than I did. Some of the listeners know I spent three and a half years at a pharma and now I've left a little over two years ago. So I don't know if I'm going to grow it back or not, but good fact. Yeah, just in time. So when I got to pair, the first question I asked was, how do you e-prescribe an app? And nobody knew. And so I went over to the National Council for Prescription Drug Programs, or NCPDP, and started a task group with Jeff Abraham, who at the time was the vice president of market access at Achille. And we worked through how you would do that. Now, it turns out that NCPDP had already solved the problem for uh, durable medical equipment. It's almost exactly the same, except that you're dispensing software instead of a product. So it was already figured out. We just needed to go through the effort of ensuring that it would work under those same scenarios. Now, oddly enough, people are still mostly using fax machines, but that's okay. We can talk about that later. That's a whole other subject that we can get into. Yeah. So with that, working through market access, patient service centers, the whole sort of commercial process around bringing these products to market, I went over to Cognoa as their first commercial person and started working through all of that. They are focusing on their autism diagnostic, which obviously isn't a digital therapeutic, but feels very much the same. I realized though through like my government affairs work and things like that, that I cared more about the plumbing and the mechanics of how everybody can go to market as opposed to just one product itself. So when the CEO position for the Digital Therapeutics Alliance opened up, again, when I heard about it, I think I took about five seconds. <laughs> and jump right in. Yeah. Amazing. My interesting fact, though, because that wasn't my interesting fact in the beginning, was when I was a kid, I sang in the Philadelphia Boys Choir. And so I performed in professional operas and at Carnegie Hall in New York a couple times. Oh, wow. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> you know, maybe as a bonus, if we feel like it's somewhere throughout this podcast, you can do like 10 seconds of something just to surprise our listeners. But, you know, that's going to be up to you. <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> all right. All right. So that's fair point. Okay. I'm going to rewind back. I think it was 2017 where the DTA was launched actually at the Frontiers Health Conference in Europe. And in season one, we also had Megan Coder and Jessica Schull on two separate episodes. And they've done an amazing job taking it from zero to one and beyond, I would even say. 
And when the role opened up, and then for you, as you mentioned earlier, it took a couple of seconds to say yes, right? What's the mandate or what was the mandate? If you can just describe as this industry is just exploding in a positive way, right? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, first, Megan, of course, still works here and she is uh, an incredible team member. She moved to Europe, as I think you know, or she moved to the UK, actually, the Isle of Jersey. And they realized that they needed more of a presence in the United States for the person who's running it. And she had to take a step. So she took a step back. Also had a baby at the same time. <laughs> so <laughs> lots of life changes. Yes. But what they were looking for was somebody who understood commercialization of these products, not who has proven that they can do it because there's only like two of those people and they're pretty rich now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But somebody who understood all the pieces and could help our membership move towards how they bring their products to market. Because not that the FDA piece is figured out, the regulation is not 100% there, but there's a pathway. There's the breakthrough pathway and there's the de novo and 510K. Megan spent a lot of time on that when we first formed because people didn't really know the FDA was still figuring it out. And so now we're at this next phase where companies are going to market and we see a lot of blockers. And basically everything that I had been working on in my past. So it felt sort of like the natural progression of where the DTA needed to head. You know, and coming in as a CEO and a fully, as I've been, I'll say passively in the industry, right? And I think last season, I've always said, I'm not in the front lines. And yes, I'm a fan. And this podcast specifically is to tell the stories of the trailblazers in your own words, right? So I'm not a practitioner, but I think from the perspective of where the industry is at, that the clinical evidence is here and more of it is coming. And some of those paths, as you started, we prescribe software, right? Yes, there's many things there, but let's go through, because as a CEO, there's many parameters to this, right? And yes, commercialization is a key component. And I love the website and how transparent you guys are on some of the objectives that you're working on and you're firing on a lot of different cylinders. But maybe for the listeners, you can kind of go through what are some of the key components? Yes, commercialization is one, but are the things that you guys are working on to propel the industry forward? Sure. So we put three pillars together. The first one that I had when I came through the door was building community. And so not that we hadn't done that in the past, So, but Digital Therapeutics Alliance started as a group of DTX companies trying to figure out what they were doing, right? And what the industry needed. We are now at a place where every player is involved, everything from legal firms to government employees, hospital systems, Google, Apple, Everybody has an opinion and is driving towards how to get these products into the hands of patients. We're at a point where it's rare now that I have to explain what a digital therapeutic is. I mean, of course, it's because I travel in that circle. There are still a lot of people who don't know. But, you know, when I went down on Capitol Hill four and a half years ago, they said, what are you talking about? Now we're in a place where you go down on Capitol Hill and they know more about regulatory than I do. <laughs> That's amazing to hear. And I think this is the kudos to your point to the earlier community and the team to actually gather the stakeholders around and define it. And even though I think the actual definition may tweak and also evolve as the industry grows, but it's a big kudos to the team that initial definition that you can talk about it, that you know people are on the same page at least. Absolutely. Yeah. So what we said was, how do we get all of these people involved in the alliance instead of it just really being manufacturers? And so we very much opened things up to all sorts of ecosystem partners, resource partners, and also companies that want to have a digital therapeutic down the line can join. It used to really be that you had to have a, a digital therapeutic to be a member. And now it's more if you want to learn the right way to do things and be part of this community so that you can ensure that your product is clinically validated appropriately and safe and effective, you can be a member as well. So it really sort of changed the way that we're looking at the community. Look at that. I learned something new. We're running Your Coach Health for a coaching community, and we now actually have a toolbox in there that we call it health scribing, you know, non-prescription, self-paced digital tools. So we're going to look into joining DTA. I didn't know that. Excellent. Oh, nice. That's great. The other pillar is creating market pathways. And that has a lot to do with reimbursement, which I know we're going to talk about more later. So I won't go into uh, that too much. 
And then the last one is commercial acceleration, which there's a question on that as well. So those are really the three things that I brought to the board in my first meeting, and they've sort of stuck because it felt right. But now we always do education. That's another pillar, but sort of core to who we are. This is like, we're going out to saying these are like our focus, our three pillars that we're focusing on for at least this year. But I imagine that'll continue. We're going to take a quick break and be right back with Andy Molnar, the CEO of Digital Therapeutics Alliance. So before we get to the regulatory environment, right, because I know that's complex and we'll need to sort of probably go a little bit deeper. Well, any of these points are pretty complex, even building a community, right, and the stakeholder map. But let's start with the commercialization, as you mentioned, because that was sort of the big mandate for you and the team going forward. And I want to know how Andy and the DTA, you guys are thinking about the commercialization, especially as it's defined the non-prescription and prescription routes, right? Those are channels. My journalistic partner from season one, I don't know if he coined it or not, but the PDTs and he's stratifying it by channels, not necessarily other ways. So I want to know how you guys are thinking about it and how the members are thinking about it and some of the challenges around this commercialization paths. Yeah, sure. So... We look at it as, I think it was six different buckets, but basically there are many different business models, right, for how these products can come to market. If you're going the traditional pathway where you need like a HixPix code or like an NDC type code, if you're more like a drug, or you're looking at the coding for doctors to get reimbursed, that's sort of your traditional path that's more for the PDTs, how the providers get reimbursed can function for both. Then there's the other pathways where you look at products that are going direct to employers. Maybe they're companion products as well, products that are under a programmatic spend that don't need to be prescribed in any area. Like, right, it's most of the time we talk employers, but it could be, you know, a hospital system or something else. And then direct to consumer, of course. And so we focus on all of it. I think it feels like we are loudest about PDTs, but that's because the employers cover non-PDTs and have for years. We have partners like the brokers and people like that who come and help those companies figure out how to talk to employers. And so it's not like we're not doing anything there. We're not necessarily as loud about it because it's kind of flowing. Yeah. And it also needs an organization like yourself to really drive this big boulder up the hill, right? As far as understanding what is a prescription digital therapeutic I still think while I think FDA has been amazing, from my understanding, there's still a lot of work to be done. Right. I mean, it's a major hurdle, particularly CMS doesn't have a benefit category, which is why that new bill just got introduced a couple of weeks ago. So the FDA can designate you breakthrough, but you still can't get covered or reimbursed by Medicare. And the problem is if you can't get reimbursed by Medicare, that coding flows down to commercial payers as well. And it flows down through Medicaid. So even though you can technically get paid for under Medicaid policy, it's really complex if you don't have the proper code, which is the HixPix code. That's a huge focus because it's one of the biggest barriers right now. Obviously, I saw it, but as our listeners are learning here, maybe we can actually rewind back a little bit. And I would say a good time to start is somewhere in that summer of 2020 or April of 2020, when the FDA issued the enforcement policy, right? And that gave quite a bit of a boost on one end to the digital therapeutic company. So if we can kind of rewind back a little bit, starting with that and the impact, and then to, as of last couple of weeks ago, just give the viewers a little bit of the regulatory policy runway. Let's put it that way. Sure. Yeah. Well, it took a pandemic for people to realize that telehealth was necessary so let's see what it takes <laughs> for, for digital health. Um, no, those changes in policy were helpful in a way. There was a couple of companies that utilized them to launch and to basically start collecting real world evidence. However, for digital therapeutics, it still didn't solve the reimbursement problem. So the way that they were getting paid still obviously was not through Medicare, was not through the same coding channels. It still had to be either direct to consumer or under some sort of pilot program. So while it was helpful, that's why not every company jumped on it because they knew that, okay, well, you can launch now, but what's going to happen in a year when they reverse it and we still don't have all this other stuff set up. So let's focus on the rest of it instead of that. 
So with that, there was a lot of work done on the Prescription Digital Therapeutics Act. Again, the one that got introduced a couple of weeks ago. There was a lot of focus on that. We were trying to get it introduced last year because of the importance during COVID for digital therapeutics. And unfortunately, they were so overwhelmed with everybody said, oh, yeah, this relates to COVID. We have to get it in the package. This relates to COVID. We have to get it in the package. And so it did not. In the meantime, the remote therapeutic monitoring codes were created so providers could finally get paid for using digital therapeutics. And that was through the American Medical Association. And um, that was incredibly exciting. Still, a lot more work to do there, but at least they're out there and cover cognitive behavioral therapy, musculoskeletal, and respiratory. Speaking of coverage, and I think this is where a lot of the debate, especially on the PDTs, is ongoing. If you think about software and the promise of a digital therapeutic is access, right? Is access by people that may or may not have the right coverage. And I think while there's some pricing that's showing up in the marketplace and the reimbursements, I think some of the slack that some of these providers, DTX companies are getting is, well, it's priced probably similar as to drug levels and other things. And so how do you look at access and again, this is probably more related to the PDT market versus the non-PDT market. So curious on how you look at that access pricing. I mean, everybody does need to make money, you know, at the end of the day. Yeah, well, I have to be careful when I talk about pricing based on the fact that I run a trade organization. But just at a top line, it all comes down to the health economic value and cost offsets and things like that. I've done a couple of health econ studies on these products, and you very quickly find out what the value is to the healthcare system and to the patient. Now, there's always some flex there, but instead of saying, like, I compare it to a drug, I think when the cure for hep C came out, it was priced at eighty or $90,000, and everybody got upset. But they were like, well, this person's not going to have liver cancer now. They're not going to have all these other diseases that come with the awful, awful death that you have from hep C. It was sort of, I think, understood, at least in the healthcare community. Now, none of our products are $80,000 at this point, so please don't, don't say, think that I'm comparing them to a cure for hep C. I was going to say, not even anywhere close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when I started, people would say, well, what are you going to sell them for $2.99 on the app store, right? <laughs> You're like, well, then you wouldn't take through a clinical trial and through the FDA if that was the goal. Not the goal, but if the value was two ninety nine, dollars would be the point. But really, like what we hear, there's so much talk about health equity and these types of products offered that. But for there to be health equity, it needs to be covered by Medicaid and Medicare and then the commercial payers as well. But you can get access to the software anywhere. You hear stories all the time of people who have to drive three hours to go to a specialist or something. And you can do that now with the combination of telehealth and digital therapeutics. You can do a lot of that work remotely for people who are most in need. Well, that sound means it's time for a question from my clinical and commercial partner on this podcast, Chandana Fitzgerald, who is the chief medical officer and general manager of Health Excel, and as her friends call her, Dr. No Crack. Let's see what question Chandana has for our guest today. Hey, Andy. Given some of the recent news on reimbursements or lack thereof by major payers like Aetna, is this why the Payer Acceleration Board was set up? Thanks, Chandana. That's a great question. Yeah, when Aetna put that medical policy out, it took a lot of us by surprise. It even took some people by surprise within Aetna and CVS who were working towards how to get these types of products covered. Now, they're a massive organization, so obviously... One hand isn't always talking to the other. That being said, because there are other policies out there as well, we look at it as a positive. And I don't want that to sound like it's just me from DTA saying, oh, this is so great that we got a policy that says we're experimental only. But what it means is we are at a place where major payers need to put medical policies together because DTX is becoming such a big deal. And they know that they have to make decisions on it and they have to figure that out. This is the same in the pharmaceutical world as well. Initial products get denied because they have to do their review. So if you're getting on a formulary at, say, CVS, you're always NDC blocked. That's the number one thing that happens. Then they do their review and they make their decision. But until they can do their review, 
at least in the pharmacy world, there's a process for it, right? Now we have a baseline to point to when they say, okay, here's, we're looking at every product. And by the way, they put every DTX product on the same medical policy, which when have you ever seen a medical policy that runs across, um, what, 10 different disease? Different therapeutic areas, right? Yeah. So with that, we are now at a place where we can go to them and point to the results that they made and point to what kind of data we have to take it to another place and hopefully get the products covered. And I'll chime in again on Chandana's question here. I noticed on your website, you also created a payer acceleration board. And so, as you mentioned earlier, key component of your role as an organization, also educating. So can you talk about, is this in response to, and again, not to single out Aetna, I know there were a few others, but how are you guys thinking about this payer acceleration board? So a couple of different ways. It wasn't in response to Aetna. We had come up with this concept last year, but it was more as a response to how do we build the community? Again, back to that, to say we want to get things in front of commercial decision makers ahead of time. And we want them to tell us, okay, this is not the right direction. Or let me take this internally to my organization and ask that question and get back to you so that we're getting real feedback from the people who are ultimately going to make the decision. Now, part of that commercial acceleration in general is this idea of how do we, we have a value guide that Megan has been working on, which will probably be announced before this podcast comes out so I can talk about it here. Um, So we just released the value and assessment guide and we're bringing as our first order with the accelerator board is we've had 40 or 50 different payers look at it already or individuals that represent payers. But it's to say, okay, now we want your organization to use something like this, how do we go about doing that? And so that's all part of that commercial accelerator board. And so with the hopes that down the road, it's not these one-off sort of, okay, I'm going to talk to everybody, figure out what kind of data is out there and whatever. They're going to say, bring us the data in this following format and just like an AMCP dossier or something like that that you would use in pharmaceuticals. So lots of work to be done in U.S. alone, especially as we've been talking about the prescription digital therapeutic. I know kind of the large employer market, while yes, it exists still in other countries, it is very sort of U.S. centric, just the way the overall healthcare system operates. But I also noticed, and I think Jessica Schillerspare had of that, you know, last year and the year before, international work, right? I know, obviously, the shining light was on Germany with DIGA, Belgium, NHS. I know you guys published nine country briefs, but there's, you know, what, 190 something countries, 195 countries in the world. So curious what you're seeing out there, how closely you're working with other countries as well, and just kind of describe where you guys are going as a DTA from within that scope. Sure. Obviously, when Jessica was here, she did a really great job internationally. She still helps us out a bit, but losing her as a full-time person was was rough. Um, so basically, since we've been reorganizing how we function, Megan, who now lives in the UK, is going to be taking over all of that work that Jessica was doing and picking that back up. There's a ton of convening necessary right now in the UK because they've obviously shown that they see a pathway and that they see the positive potential of digital therapeutics. And so what DTA wants to be is a place, again, where the relationships are there, the community can build, and that we can start to look at how you analyze or how you review these products sort of following DIGA and the one that France, I forget, DHA, I think they call it now, um, (laughs) to sort of do what Germany's doing. The other big focus for us then is Asia Pacific, which is just incredibly complex. (laughs) And so, well, I think we have 12 or 14 members in the APAC region. It still feels very new, you know? So we look at it at DTA as sort of the natural progression of how digital therapeutics sort of started and then like where they're heading. And so it's like US, Europe, Asia. And so that seems like that that's the way we're moving. You know, it's interesting just where we're looking at the stats as we were launching this season. And we actually had Korea was number three on the listener list behind US and UK. So it was fascinating because I think up until a certain point, I don't remember the exact, but 
you know, digital health was, I don't want to say illegal, but there was like, you know, complexities around in that. So it just goes to show for the adoption. And for the listeners, I just kind of checked at the same time. So there are nine briefs up there today on the DTA website, Australia, China, France, Germany, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, UK, and of course, United States. So as we've gone sort of a little bit around the world and the effort, so it is still a lot of, you know, I'll say continuing that community building around the world, everything from defining to working through the regulatory systems. Let's kind of jump back and maybe summarize a little bit because we talked about different levels of commercialization. Yes, you know, PDT and the regulatory But if you had to summarize, what are some of the really key items on that scaling of the companies that have been around already and that level of commercialization? You know, many members that probably of yours of the DTA, but also guests on the last show, while these are privately held companies, the understanding is from a revenue perspective, it's not where anybody wants it to be, but it's a longer game, of course. So if you can summarize the scaling challenges for these companies, that would be fantastic for the listeners. Sure. Well, the first and biggest one is the most obvious, and that's reimbursement. Without proper coding, without Medicare covering the products, it's just a slog. I mean, it's a slog anyway, particularly in the US, right? You have to talk to, I mean, three major payers, but then, you know, about 20 to 30 more and have them all make decisions so that you can have actually scale your product. So number one, reimbursement on the Medicare side. Number two, commercial payer adoption. And then the third, which maybe I shouldn't order these, is uh, provider adoption. And depending on who you're selling to, you could be selling to anywhere between 1,000 and 100,000 doctors. And this is, a, in many ways, a major change in workflow for them. So early adopters love it because they see technology, they see the future, they see how it can help them. I do agree. And actually, I remember kind of when we're doing the first season, it was a little bit too early to talk to kind of on the ground, front lines, docs. We're going to try to get someone and we have some ideas around on the show. But I think, you know, to your point, you know, 80,000 pediatricians, how do these, let's call them software companies ultimately, right? Company not replicating the models, heavy sales models of a pharma company, and reaching them more digitally, dynamically, educating. And then ultimately, I think there are some challenges which we'll also cover in this season, even at the pharmacy level. Today, you prescribe, a pharmacist handles some of the drug-drug interactions, edits, and all of that. What happens with the DTX at that level? Lots of challenges ahead on that. Yeah. I think with adoption, one of the biggest things is getting your associations and patient advocacy groups together because they'll help drive the innovation if they believe in it. Well, what I heard are the couple of things that probably keep you awake at night, but hopefully not. Hopefully you have a DTX for sleep that you're using. But as we start in this plenty, prescription and non-prescription, And we won't name any names here, but our listeners can go back to season one and hear from a couple of those companies. But as we started with interesting fact about you and, you know, again, the people that are driving this industry forward, we also want to end with you. And so, again, you know, as we learned what keeps you awake, we also want to learn what gets you actually up in the morning outside of the alarm. (laughs) Yeah, my children, they get me up in the morning as well. It was interesting. I just did a personality test and I think my number two trait was being futuristic, right? So thinking about what excites me down the road drives me for what I do today. It's funny because my wife's grandfather bought and sold semiconductor companies in the 80s and 90s. So it did quite well for himself. And so first time I met him, I asked him what made him successful. And he said, well, Andy, I could always see the future. And I thought to myself, that does nothing for me. (laughs) But that was all I got from him. I'm not saying I can always see the future, but in certain scenarios now where I am in my career, it now makes a lot of sense to me. So when I think of the change that we can make in healthcare to patients' lives and well-being, this is the next big thing. This is the way that you get whole person care where when you walk out of the doctor's office with a diagnosis, 
you're not just going home feeling alone or going online to read what's happening. It's a time where you're like, okay, you have cancer. You're going to be depressed. Here's a product that helps you with depression associated with cancer. Here's something else with all the materials you need to know to learn about what's going to happen next and who you need to talk to. I use cancer a lot and I also use stroke, right? Post-stroke, you have intensive care and then you basically go home. I don't know about you, but if somebody I knew had a stroke, I would have no idea how to take care of them. And so when I think of what digital can do and its potential, and that's probably still going to be 5, 10, 15 years out, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning now. The bright future of helping people, and especially I think, again, back to what we talked about earlier, the access to that and not just the patients themselves, as you mentioned, but also caregivers, right? A lot of times we forget about the caregivers as a you know key individual on that journey with the patient. On that note, Andy, thank you very much for joining us. We are going to be going with the season you know, full speed ahead as this industry is going full speed ahead. And kudos to you and the team on what you guys have accomplished to date and going to accomplish going forward. Thank you very much for having me. This has been great and I'm humbled to be the first one of the season. So appreciate it. Thanks for tuning into the Digital Therapeutics Edition of Digital Health Today, a production of mission-based media. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast player so you're automatically notified each time I speak with one of these amazing leaders and trailblazers who are forging the path for digital therapeutics. If you'd like to learn more about Your Coach Health or Health Excel, you can find the links to this and more in the show notes for this episode. I'm Eugene Borohovich, and catch you next time.